Well, welcome back. Let's get out of the missing the forest and the trees and come to the hard business. This session is about founding to funding, LSS at the business inception level. And the first topic we'll have is designing the world-class products and services using LSS. And our first speaker is Mr. Bill Remy. He is the President and CEO of TBM Consultants India Private Limited. He has more than 25 years experience in business management and manufacturing operations. He has expertise, his expertise includes operational performance improvement through Lean Six Sigma. And his experience is in broad phases of business leadership across various industries, including aerospace, defense, railway, industrial and agriculture equipment, technology and process automation. At In Venice, prior to TBM, he was responsible for implementation of companies' global continual improvement programs, which delivered over 100 million pounds in annual productivity improvements. That's a lot of money. Trained 3,000 associates and over 5,000 completed Kaizens. He's a Bachelor of Science and a Master of Science in Industrial Engineering from Oklahoma, Oklahoma State University. Ladies and gentlemen, I have great um, pleasure in presenting you, Mr. Bill Ramey. Please. Good afternoon. I was going to say good morning, but good afternoon. Um, I'm going to keep this relatively quick, quick paced. I'm, I'm honored to be here again. I was here last year, and it's, it's an honor to be back to speak to you again. Um, we're going to talk mostly about the product development cycle, and I'm going to give you some ideas about how to think about it, some key metrics, and, and how to think about the process. This isn't working, so we'll go to the backup. So when we, we think about product development challenges, the, th the things we see on the left are the things we need to think about. So what are the strategic insights? We've, we've heard this morning, and, and this is just going to get reinforced over the day, you've got to know your customer, know your markets, know your customer, and, and to the extent that you can go walk in their shoes, you can understand how they really find value in your product or your service. right? Second is prioritization. This is one that people typically do very poorly. We heard about Hoshan planning. The whole idea behind the key thing about Hoshan planning is to be clear about what you're going to focus on as well as being clear about what you're not going to focus on. Because if we try to be all things to all customers and all markets, we will fail. Right? So we have to be very focused. We have to prioritize. And we have to prioritize in our product development process and a given product launch on the critical few things that are going to drive value. And we have to, the single biggest thing we have to guard against is scope creep. So we have to stop the selling and marketing people at some point and say, enough, right? Because otherwise we will perpetually be defining features and functions in the product and we will not move forward. Then we have to think about process capability. So how repeatably can our product development process deliver value to the customer. The one thing that I would tell you that we've heard this morning that is absolutely true, speed, speed, speed. And in order to be fast, you've got to get the process capable. It has to deliver repeatable results. Right? So we have to focus on that. I would, tell, I would offer to you that having an average process and executing it flawlessly, repeatably, is better than defining a world-class process that we execute poorly, right? Because we, we often run off and we design these processes. Oh, we've got the... I, I remember this. I went to work for a company, and I went in the conference room. There was a beautiful layout of a stage gate product development process. And I looked at it for a while and thought, wow, that's good. 
they've really thought this out. Somebody says, do we follow this? Oh, no, 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 that's just for looks. <laughs> right? So it's how well you execute, right? And then we have to communicate. Communicate with the customer, communicate with our teams to make sure that everybody is aligned with what we're trying to accomplish, right? When you think about your growth strategy and products, we can think about, this is the standard consulting four block. All consultants have to use a four block diagram. Um, but you can think about in the top existing products across new markets and products and you know, existing and new products. What you have to be clear on for a given launch, where are you focusing? Are you focusing in this upper left block for market penetration where you're taking existing markets and existing products and extending? So it can be extending life cycles, can be replacement, or are you trying to go to new markets? Because those generate different risk profiles, they generate different investment profiles, and they, they drive needs back into the product development process. If you're trying to penetrate new markets, you're going to have to spend more time up front, for sure, in the voice of the customer. Because it's new. You don't know it. So you have to go spend more time up front. So we think about the, just the basic process, right? Very simple. Inputs, what's the process and the outcomes? We frequently focus too much on the outcomes. I want the results, right? Unfortunately, when you think about results for product development for a company, there's not a knob or a switch that says, I want more cash, I want more EBITDA. You have to focus on the inputs and the process in order to drive those outcomes. And, and if you think about it, and we've heard this morning, we reinforce it, the inputs, you've got to focus on getting the inputs right. This is no different than your manufacturing process. If you have bad raw material, you will get a bad product. I don't care how good your transformation process is. The same is true with product development. What's your customer say? What's the market say? What's the competitive landscape? Where are you trying to position this product, and what is it going to solve? Either what is it going to solve for the customer, or what will it help enable for your customer? What will it help them accomplish and do with their business, with their use? Right? If it's a consumer product, what does it make possible for them? Right? Think about the breakthroughs in the last 10 years. What have certain consumer products helped people do? We've, we've had some people talk about cell phones. How long have cell phones been around? Not that long, right? We went from, if I think back to my first cell phone, it weighed about eight pounds, and, and, and I needed to work out to carry it around. Today, you have the same power in a cell phone over there that had in the first mainframe computer that I programmed in college. Now, that says something about how long ago it was I programmed, but... The same computing, in fact, more computing horsepower, right? You carry a phone with 32 gigabytes of storage. So understand the inputs. What are we trying to accomplish? What can we do for the customer? Then we can focus on the process, right? How effectively do we convert those needs, those wants, the delighters, to something that the customer can use? And how rapidly can we convert that? So the things that we try to get out of this are the bottom line, right? We want to, for ourselves, inwardly focused, we want to meet our revenue and earnings objectives, right? But in order to do that, we've got to have the right product, which meets those needs. It's got to be at the right time. Not only from a cycle time, lead time of the development process, but you've got to hit the market timing. In some markets, in consumer markets, if you miss the market timing, by just a couple of months, you'll miss the window, right? And you'll miss the volume curves. So you've got to hit not only your lead time, right, your schedules, but you've got to hit the market window. And that's often critical. You also have to get the right cost structure. You, can't, it, you sometimes can win on price and cost, and other times you win on value. Where are you going to compete? But you have to get your cost structure right. You have to make sure that as you're developing the product, when you take it to market, the cost structure is where it needs to be. Because once you go to market, 
how hard is it to go back and change the cost structure? Once you have your whole supply chain laid out, once all the material is flowing, and now we say, oh, it costs 20% too much, and we've gone to market. Huge amounts of rework, right? So we've got to do that right. So we would tell you, I would offer to you that a, a good process is one that is stage gate driven. Stage gates can have a little bit different flavor. You can adjust them and define them a little bit differently than what I'm showing here. But you need to have a stage gate driven process, right? Something that starts with what are the needs of the market, the customer, and you define those things. And the business case that goes with them. Because so where are we going to play with the product? How do we make money and how do we satisfy a need, right? And transition that through all the way to launch. Some of the things that, that you have to be rigid about to be successful or at each stage gate, you've got to have a clear checkpoint of standard work and a checkup on the project and the product to say, is it doing what we expect it to do? There is a certain amount of courage that, that people struggle with that at certain stage gates, you should always review the business case. Is this going to hit what we need to from a revenue and earnings? Rarely, if ever, have I seen companies cancel a product. And the further they get in this process, the more they are unwilling to cancel it, even though they could be clear at product and production preparation, they're building capacity and supply chain, and it's clear the product will not meet objectives. It's clear it could be a loser right out of the gate, but yet they move forward. Right? Because there's too much perceived sunk cost. You have to be careful, because all you're going to do is spend more money and drive it off the cliff. The other thing I've seen not done well that is, is critical is this last step. Once you go to market, you hit launch, you see where you're going to be, what's the learning process that says, all right, what do we do well? We call them plus deltas. What were the things that went really well in this product development, this launch, and what are the things we could do better? Not as many companies do that. And that's key to build into your process. The other thing to think about, and this is typical, so where do design changes hit? In a normal product development cycle, the curve looks like this. We hurry up and we get through concept, design, we get into production engineering, and we push to get to trials. I need pilot runs, I need pre-production units as fast as possible. So we push, push, push. And then what happens? Then the design changes come. Because as we start building it, we find out things that, oh, this didn't work, suppliers didn't perform, I go to assemble it, it doesn't fit, because I didn't spend the time up front. The other key thing is, we typically still view this as a siloed mentality. So marketing and sales conceives the product, and they throw it over to the technical people. The engineers do their magic, and then they throw it to supply chain and production, who then try to figure out how they're going to build it, buy it, and assemble it, test it, and ship it. Right? And then we get to the customer, and they go, but this isn't what I want, or it doesn't work. Ideally, the idea, drive your investment forward. First of all, build a cross-functional team all the way at the beginning. It is amazing what I have seen happen, this was in a rail example, where we actually took engineers, we took production people and supply chain people, and had them ride the trains that we were going to be working on and replacing. Go spend time just riding the trains. See how well they line up at the stops, doors opening and closing, mechanisms, how people load and unload, see what people do on the trains, right? And they go to the service site. How do they service them? What are their problems? It's amazing if you get the supply chain and manufacturing people in up front, how much they can see about what the product does and does not do and solve problems that the engineers might see. Conversely, make the engineers go build a few. It's amazing what happens when you ask an engineer, this was in a, an automotive application in a, in a large vehicle brake application, there's a, there's a, a blind assembly of an O-ring down in a hydraulic assembly. 
that is virtually impossible and has about a 40% yield of getting the O-ring, and we're talking an O-ring about this big, of getting it in without cutting it, nicking it, or, or getting it installed correctly. So when you go make the engineers do it, it's like, wow, that's hard. How do these guys do that every day? Right? It's amazing what happens when you, when you do that, right? So you force the focus up front. The other thing that helps, if we've built a lean organization, so this is where lean and operations can start to tie to the product development, we always start the beginning of product development with a marketing forecast. So how many of you in operations, when you run a sales and operations planning process, take the forecast from your sales and marketing organization and, and believe that it's 100% accurate and you run the business to it? How many of your forecasts are 100% accurate? Well, at least everybody's honest, right? They're not. So why would you take the marketing forecast for a new product, even in a market that you know, and plan capacity to it? knowing it has to be flawed, right? What we should do is, and, and, and these things drive, you know, so, so we have to build to the forecast. That's going to cost us $20 million. What we should really do is just inherently know that the volume will either come slower, it might come faster, not always, but it'll come slower, it, the timing may be different. So how do we build a strategy where we invest incremental capital, incremental capacity, and build that in as we design the production system to support the design of the product. Far more efficient for your business, right? If you've done a lot of Lean Six Sigma work in your business, in operations, supply chain, you can do this. Right? You can leverage that capability. So we think, so where do we stand to industry standard? How do we measure up against our industries? It's sometimes nice to look across industries. There can be some insight. But predominantly, you compete against your industry. Right? So what metrics are we using? We've got some listed. Some, you can come up with others. But that first one, average time to market, that's our speed one. If you can drive that one, somebody talked about failing fast, 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 fast. Frequently, the way we can start to keep the scope focused and prioritized to satisfy the sales marketing people who see this huge potential is how fast can we keep introducing products and derivatives to get the functionality out there instead of trying to do it all at once. Right? So speed is key. The other one that you think about, this next to the last one I would offer to you is one that will help you judge the health of your business and growth vitality. If you look at a business how much of their annual revenue is coming from products that were introduced recently, the last two to three years? Right? Depends on the industry, right? If you're fast-moving consumer goods, two to three years is too long. Right? If you're Apple or if you're uh, Sony or LG, maybe not the last two or three years, maybe how much in the last 18 months is the right metric. It's irrelevant. I'm not as focused on the time frame as it is understanding the percentage of contribution of revenue from new products new derivatives that are driving growth. Right? That's the key metric. So we have a case study. Hubble builds um, very diversified products. They're now about a $3 billion U.S. company. They build lighting products. They build electrical products, things for the grid. In this particular case, this product was for telecommunications rooms. So these are the racks that you might have in your room that store servers and modems and you know, racks of electronics. This industry was designed back in the analog days. If you go way back, this derived clear back to things where we just had prints, lots of analog boards, right? So the racks were stagnant. They tried for a length of time. They've been trying for a couple of years to introduce new product. And, and this new product that they were working on, they kept adding some things, add some features, but they never really got the breakthrough. It didn't, no step function change. It was a small incremental. Very frustrated. So they backed up and said, look, let's rethink this. We partnered up with them. We said, how can we implement a design for Lean Sigma process into this business? So we went in with a basic concept, took a couple of pilot projects, and what we saw was we took the total time from about 20 months they were taken down to 11 months. The big key was that we took out, look how many fewer parts. 80% fewer parts. 
Think about the impact that has to the cost structure. Think about that impact that can have to quality. 80% fewer opportunities for a defect because I'm not fabricating, I'm not assembling those products, right? those subcomponents. Um, and what it did is it now leveraged something into deliverable and a revenue gain that now was step function, step function change for them. So in closing, just some parting thoughts. Is your product development process a competitive advantage? Is it something that in your business is a competitive advantage for you today? If it is, great. If not, what are the barriers? What are the things that you need to achieve that advantage? What do you need to do differently? Same thing, it, it, is, it a, is it a competency around commercialization? You know, sometimes we miss that. I've also seen great product development and they got to the end and the launch commercialization, commercialization that word is too big. The go to market, the, the getting it in the hands of the customer, they dropped the ball. They, they had a great product, but they didn't get the pipeline filled, they didn't manage the distribution channels, the marketing collateral, or, and things like that. So, same thing. They didn't get it at the right time. They got it to a point and then they dropped it. Right? Um, and, and the last thing to just think about is, so how much can you, if you could improve, if you could dramatically improve your product development process, what impact could it have to the organization? How much can it accelerate your growth? I would offer you that if you were in a Lean Six Sigma company, you should be able to leverage your growth in earnings and EBITDA 3x or more of your industry. Between operational excellence and product development excellence, you should be able to out leverage at least 3x. All right, thank you. Thank you, Bill. It was great. Our next speaker is Mr. N.C. Narayanan. He's founder and chief managing director, SSA Business Solutions. He has more than 42 years of industrial experience and has held senior management positions at Crompton Greaves as GM Techni Technical and Lucas TVS. He's a master black belt and has authored two books. He has chaired events such as IQPC BPE Summit at Cape Town. He has been recognized with Global Achievers Award by Economic Development Forum of India and Rashtriya Udhyog Ratna Award. I have great pleasure in presenting you Mr. N.C. Narayan. Please. Good afternoon to you may not be a good idea to choose the last session in the forenoon and the first session in the post-lunch. Uh, the topic that I have chosen to talk today is uh, on the design and development uh, of a world-class products and service. Having spent about a quarter century as a designer myself and uh, practicing uh, Six Sigma enthusiast last 15 years, uh, I'm just trying to give you a 30,000 feet perspective of uh, what my views about uh, the current situation. To start with, if you really look at uh, the business is uh, ultimately is existing for making money. There are three uh, facets of the business. One is the top management and the senior management looking at the visioning and strategizing at, as one corner of the triangle. And then many organizations have chosen to create a business excellence uh, as a function in the organization. And then there are people who are chasing the numbers in the organization. If you look at the language that the management speaks uh, is the money. The business excellence people talk about the quality tools and the shop floor people understand things. So as J Juran says that uh, you need to be multilingual in case if you have to communicate with each other. So this is one of the issues that is we are facing and discussing since this morning. And ultimately the chief financial officer is asking, 
where is the money? So having said that, if you look at the overall perspective of an organization, you have three basic uh, functions, I would say. The people who are busy in converting the raw material into finished goods, and the people who are trying to understand the market needs and create new products. And then there are support functions are there. If I can put all the functions into different uh, boxes, I will end up with these three areas. And if you like, probably the Brahma's role is played by the development people and who are supposed to take care of the perpetuity of the organization. And the sustenance role is Lord Vishnu's role, which is supposed to maintain the organization. And of course, the Mahesh is sitting outside to see that how he can destroy the organization. Yeah? So these are the three basic rules. And then let's look at how the business excellence has been looked at. One of the most neglected area is the perpetuity of the organization. I will also like to share with you what really created uh, this situation and what could be a solution. As Bill was mentioning, for some historical reasons, the operational excellence has become the most important area because uh, in a protected uh, economy, transferring into a global economy, and there is a big uh, cost-saving opportunity exists in the operational excellence. And we have been deliberating since morning that uh, how we are going to enroll the senior level management and the first presentation was how to link the strategy with the operational excellence and so on. But there's one major area which is totally uh, ignored or neglected is the product development uh, part. That's, that's the reason that uh, this session has been uh, visualized part of this presentation. If you look at for some historical reason, the paradigm is that variation reduction, eliminating the defect where Six Sigma came from, is one of the facets of the continuous improvement. And although the lean is the elder brother for uh, Six Sigma started much earlier than uh, Six Sigma, but for variety of reasons, Lean was not having that much of prominence for quite a while. And it is gaining a lot of momentum now that the waste elimination is uh, most important aspect. So you have to create the velocity for the organization. Unfortunately, the, we ended there. The business excellence is uh, nothing but uh, variation reduction and uh, uh, you know, value stream, value creation, <clears throat> that we have not uh, looked into the most important area. I was just trying to trace back the last 100 years, <clears throat> and if you look at the quality philosophy, there are seven levels I thought the quality philosophy has evolved. The level one is inspecting the product is better than selling defective products. So that's where the quality control started. Level two is inspecting the process is better than inspecting the product. So it seem to be a little more matured. Controlling the process is better than inspecting the process. That means not merely inspecting the process is not good enough. Later on, people felt understanding the process is better than controlling it. The PDCA came into existence. In the level five, reducing the variation is better than understanding the process Six Sigma came from. And level six is improving the design of the product is better than improving the process capability. If the process is uh, made fully capable, even then it can't uh, uh, deliver what the customer expectations are. Probably the highest level of maturity in the quality philosophy, understanding the employee needs of the customer and designing the product is better than modifying it. That is where the DFSS is coming from. But if you look at all our focus areas in the last uh, two decades, uh, brought us up to the level five, yeah? But what we are need to move is to the level seven, yeah? So the world-class products and services, uh, my way of interpreting it is, uh, covers the design excellence to start with. The majority of the problems in the shop floor are created by the designers. Second aspect is the SEM excellence, which is again an area where we have not focused so far, as vigorously as we should. And then the operational excellence, which has drawn the major attention all these years. And we are also ignoring one area, which is the service excellence. <coughs> Most of the companies producing excellent products 
are not able to provide the best artificial service. So, unless otherwise we are going to focus on all these four major areas, we can't really create a world-class products and service. If you really look at the various generation in which uh, uh, the continuous improvement was happening, in 80s we spoke about Six Sigma, in generation 2 we spoke about Lean, generation 3 we got them married and brought the Lean Six Sigma. And what's next? So the generation 4 is the design excellence according to my visualization. So when you say design excellence, what do you really mean? Is the first time uh, right new products? Velocity of the new product, I didn't say speed of the new product because we may produce many new products, but they fail to meet the expectations of the customer. And then ultimately value for many of the new products. So essentially design excellence can be reduced to these three attributes. Now, if you really look at the kind of uh, phases in which India has been going through, starting from the British Raj, then we moved on to the License Raj, and then now we are into the Globalization Raj, if you may like to call it. So, these transitions have put a different kind of a mindset, which I would like to draw your attention to. In 80s, till 80s probably, we have seen motor cars which are maybe seven or eight uh, decades old, in 90s, we have seen Maruti brought a big transformation in the automobile technology in the country. Change in the automobile technology has brought a significant change in the various other manufacturing capabilities of the country as well. Uh, 2000 onwards, we are seeing something which is much more complicated and demanding high level of uh, expectation like BMWs and Mercedes and so on. Where does this lead to? If you really look at the scenario, since we have been in the protected economy for pretty long time, the dependency on collaborators' design has been the order of the day, and the designer's capability has been a big question mark. And then the verification and validation methods of improving the quality of the new product has been very limited. And understanding the requirements of the customer and bringing products which has got a implied needs has been a big challenge. So that is the scenario of the new product introduction process as such. I just took uh, some data to analyze. Uh, this is a quite an interesting analysis. If you see the x-axis which is showing the various kind of uh, products, starting from uh, consumer products to aircraft on the right extreme, so as you move from the left to right, you will find the products are becoming more and more complicated. When I say complication, it is in terms of the number of components. For example, a consumer plastic may be two components, but an aircraft has got about half a million components. So as you are moving towards the right, the complexity of the product increases. As you could see, the consumer electronic two-wheelers and four-wheelers. But if you look at the sigma value, or the perfection in the product in terms of defect-free manufacture has been significantly increasing as the complexity increases. It doesn't mean if the product is simple, you will be able to produce them at Six Sigma level. So what's most important here is the process that is being adopted in design and development of the these complex products are entirely different from the low-end uh, products. So this requires a kind of an attention. So in a protected uh, economy, we, are, uh, we have been having a product out approach. Essentially, I can develop any product and put in the market, and the customer has got very limited opportunities. You will find there is a less than 35% success rate in the new product development when the product out approach is adopted. Now, we have moved into a buyer's market now. We require a different kind of approach at this point in time we need to switch over to a market in approach. To a very large extent, uh, this transformation has been happening in the last 15 years, but it's far from satisfactory. As uh, James Duran says, that the design creates the most of the errors. So they are like the eggs laid by the crocodile, and they manifest in the manufacturing process, and they also manifest as a reliability issues at the end of the product uh, usage. 
So it's extremely important for us to look at that the design excellence is the most important area we need to look at. Will has already covered that the traditional product development process is incapable of detecting all the design modifications. And when the product is launched, then we come to know a lot of problems from the field. And in India, due to the product life cycle is coming down, there's a significant reduction in the uh, time required to product development. So that's going to create more pressure on the development process. So unless otherwise we are going to go in for a much better way of developing new products, we are going to have serious problems going forward. Just to mention that the Six Sigma efforts are mostly on the defect reduction by bringing the variation to the controllable limits. But what's most interesting is that, as Michael Harry from his research says, that you can go up to 5.1 sigma level without changing the product design. If you really want to reach 6 sigma, you need to look at the product design in a greater detail. So it is more and more important for us to give uh, in the product uh, excellence in this point of view. Another aspect in terms of the cost, as you could see, 70% of the cost is decided by the designers the cost influence part. The supply chain people can only contribute up to the 20% cost influence. And the people in the shop floor can only contribute to 5%. And the people who are in the distribution can contribute only up to 5%. So vast majority of the cost influence is decided by the designers. So unless or else we are going to focus on these areas, we will never be able to produce cost effective products. So what is the new paradigm that I am recommending? That the philosophy, which is the attitudinal part, is to give wow experience to the consumer in terms of the new products. And the methodology is what I am proposing is the NPA lean. That means look at the new product development process, as Bill also mentioned in his lecture, that we need to look at product development process in the lean perspective. And there are innumerable number of tools and techniques that are already available in the DFSS uh, which can be applied for developing the new product. Essentially, when you say change in the organization, it involves structural change, the system change, and the cultural change. And uh, it's extremely difficult to change the culture, but if you change the structure and system, automatically the culture is being influenced. So one of the most important area probably we need to focus is how we can improve our new product development process. So I'm not going to dwell much on this uh, model of IDOV, which is uh, one of the uh, popular model that is being adopted for new product introduction uh, that may be probably applied. And all the definition of waste, which is in the manufacturing lean, are equally applicable to the team mode, what we talk about in the lean. Only thing the difference is the interpretation of uh, these waste in the new product development process are slightly different from the manufacturing process. So ultimately we need to get into something which is uh, more effective in terms of identifying the latent needs of the customer, design the products accordingly, optimize them with uh, cost effective design and use uh, the myriad uh, number of tools which are available uh, for product design and development. So in essence, uh, we need to look at the design optimization tools like design for manufacture and assembly. There are many of them are available, but they are not put into use. So to conclude my uh, part of my lecture, as uh, Einstein said, doing the same thing over and over again and expecting different result is insanity. Somebody has said this is stupidity. And we are more tool uh, focused at the moment, which we have been discussing since this morning. Puruhashi, in one of the recent lectures, he said that in India we are becoming toolholics. Like alcoholics, we are becoming toolholics. That's the message I want to carry forward. And then ultimately, as Steve said, the deciding what to do is as important as deciding what not to do. Thank you very much. That's all I wanted to share with you this afternoon. Well, now we'll come to a award-winning case study for business transformation using 
Dean Six Sigma, having heard what to do, let's also see, has somebody really done it and got any results out of it? And to present this, Mr. Kulbhushan, he is the Senior VP and Global Head, Business Excellence and Organizational Development, Jubilant Life Services Limited. I think you serve pizzas also. Yeah. Is that part of it? I'll eat it and you'll find how good they are. He has 19 years of experience, 9 years with GE, Certified Master Black Belt, Malcolm Baldridge Award Assessor, and is trained in Japan on Lean and TPM. His work on innovations in manufacturing has led to two award-winning creations, which he created. Great pleasure in putting you to Mr. Kulbhushan for the presentation. Good afternoon, guys. Uh, I know uh, I'm in a very precarious situation. I'm standing between you and lunch. So, and I'm going to share actually a Domino's case study with you, so you're going to feel more hungry. So please feel uh, the liberty of taking the glasses of water which are lying on your table, which are half finished or practically unfinished. So please improve your water intake <laughs> till that time. I'll try to keep it as brief as possible. And uh, uh, let's talk about some of the I've heard uh, very good speakers speaking since morning, and everyone's talking about uh, positioning of business excellence, Lean Six Sigma, at a strategic level or at a tactical level or an operational level. We all started from an operational level positioning of uh, Lean Six Sigma, and we've moved up to a strategic level, and that's the right place for it, probably. Uh, while I differ on some of the uh, thoughts being raised, I agree to most of it, but one thing I clearly believe in is if you talk the language of CEO, if you talk the language of a business head, he will clearly understand what you're talking about in Lean Six Sigma. And uh, well, last year I presented a case study where we did a business turnaround with the, with the help of, uh, uh, for a formulations company in the U.S. And we did the complete business turnaround for the company where the service levels had dropped to 64% and we uh, brought it up to 99%. It was business threatening actually, organization threatening uh, the, the situation. Uh, this year I was thinking of presenting a different case study, but I just thought let me present a more tasteful uh, case study with you, which is around Domino's. In Domino's, the most important fact is that in the next two years, we are going to sell as many number of pies of pizza as we sold in the last 15 years. So that's the kind of growth this business is seeing. We've been doing business excellence in Domino's for the last six, seven years, and we've done all kind of cost reduction, process improvement, customer delight projects, everything, right? This time, the last time I was sitting with Ajay called the CEO of Domino's, and I asked him, you know, what do you want to do in business excellence? He said, I want to do something very meaningful, something very strategic. And he said, I don't know whether you have the answer or not, but I'm calling PwC and McKinsey's to give me a presentation around this issue. His issue was that with this kind of 40% year-on-year growth, he wanted how can we minimize the capital expenditure and operational expenditure and still grow by that amount of rate. We have 500 stores in India, the largest for a food chain, food retail chain, and this would probably go to maybe 1,000 or 1,200 stores in the next five years itself. So which is what I said, in the next two years, we're going to sell as many pies as we did in the last 15 years. How do you sustain such a growth? Somewhere, your supply chain or your operation process are going to buckle. And there are so many core processes, right, from HR, finance, manufacturing, stores, warehouse operations, procurement, new product development. Now, nobody had an idea in the business which of the processes would buckle. So when Ajit spoke to all the stakeholders and functional heads and took their views, uh, which, of, which, which of them is the weakest process, everyone talked very highly of their own processes and said, we are doing very well, we'll be able to sustain the growth. The capital expenditure number that they had with them, I can't share the number with you, was running to hundreds of crores. And that's what the, his main concern was. In our company, one of the things that the chairman always measures is return over capital employed. So if you already infuse a very huge capital, as uh, the last speaker alluded to, 
you have very little chance in supply chain operations to really then give a very high return on capital employed. You already infused hundreds of crores of capital into your system. How much, with dwindling margins, how much EBITDA are you going to earn in order to actually have a return over capital employed of more than 20%? So with those challenges, we went about it. And he clearly laid down expectations. He said, you give me your presentation of your approach, and I'll compare it with McKinsey's and PwC's. And if I, I find your approach is more, is better, more robust, then I'll give you the project. So after we gave the presentation and everything, we actually won the project. This happened last year in the month of May. We took about uh, eight months to do this project, and that's what I'm going to share with you. This project is actually a DFSS project, uh, designed for Six Sigma project. It's not a project, I call it a program, because there are so many <coughs> projects underneath it. So if you look at, at a DFSS project, what it really was doing was, it was looking at a large program of DFSS, and we would have DFSS projects underneath it, and each DFSS project may also have had a number of sub-DFSS projects underneath it. So I'll try to make the situation a little easier for everyone to comprehend. So please stay with me on this. The first thing that we wanted to do was to understand what are the key needs of the organization and how does the organization see you, you know, catering to those needs. And the message was very clear from the CEO. He said that I am looking at sustainable growth. And if he is looking at sustainable growth, when we did the whole process assessment, we came out that there are two big factors which are going to actually become bottlenecks if nothing is done about them in a very robust way. One is a new product development, so the business did not have a stage gate process to develop new products, and the new product development cycle time was very high. The value maximization was not happening with new products. So every new product, they had a sales target and a beta target. They were, they were very uh, significant miss from those sales and a beta targets. The other was supply chain. And in supply chain, we clearly understood we were not talking about non-traditional constraints in supply chain. So, and that's where, you know, sometimes we've got to prove our worth as business excellence professionals. When we go to a marketing guy or a supply chain guy, we, and we're going to tell him, we're going to improve your procurement process or your sales process, what is going to tell us? I already know. He has much more, he has much more experience as compared to us. He knows much better market uh, uh, and the tools that he, he can use in order to improve those processes. What do we have additional to give it to him? So we are not looking at traditional procurement or logistics constraints here. What the business wanted were, and the stakeholders wanted was, they wanted a data-oriented, quantifiable study from us, which can, which can be used to predict how much optimization can they do on the operational expenditure and the cap, uh, capital expenditure. So we had to minimize the operational capital expenditure and still give them a quantifiable confidence that the growth plans will be met with 100% service levels. So this was the objective, a very tough objective from that perspective. So when we looked at supply chain, obviously we looked at constraints that would be there, and we zeroed down on four areas. The first was network design. So uh, let me share with you how, how Domino's works so that the picture becomes a little clear for you. So what we do is we have suppliers, and the, these suppliers, they supply a lot of ingredients, dough to us. The commissary is actually the central warehouse. It, it stores all the ingredients and it makes the doughs into balls, which they supply to different stores. The stores actually make the pizzas and they distribute the pizzas. Each commissary can actually supply to 15 to 30 stores or even more, depending on where the commissary is related. So please remember when I say the word commissary, it is actually referring to a central warehouse. So this is basically the, uh, the, the way the stores work, the way Domino's works. And when we, when we went into the problem of supply chain, we had a demand in terms of number of pies that they would be selling in the next 10 years. And, uh, and the, the jo job that was predicated with us was we have to tell them how many stores in which year, which month I should open, and to cater to those stores, how many commissaries should I open, and of what size. And what should be the, my best logistics truck routing design to, come, uh, to, trans to transport goods between my commissary and the stores. All the three optimizations had to be done in order to make sure that the capital and operation expenditure is minimized. So that's what we attempted doing here. So we went into network design and we tried to create a ob very objective model, assessment model, and understand when, where, and what size of commissary should be open, which will minimize my capital and operation expenditure. Similarly, we looked at store capacity. So when and where should I open these stores? What should be the capacity of these stores? Which stores are going to actually peak out in capacity which month of the year in the next 10 years? Please remember, this whole exercise is all futuristic. We are not looking into the past and trying to say this process can be improved. There is no background with us. 
there are no predictability metrics with us. There are no transfer functions with us where we can very easily predict that this is what can happen in the future. So everything had to be built from scratch, which is why we did a DFS program around it. The logistics optimization between commissary and stores. And finally, all this had to roll up into a sales and operation planning, which had to be made very robust. The sales and operation planning was very manual at that point in time. They were mostly looking into the past and finding out what bottlenecks did they face and how did they firefight it. But what we were going to look at is actually 10 years from now and find out what can potentially become a bottleneck in the third year or the fifth year or the seventh year and take actions for those bottlenecks today. So that was the whole uh, idea of integrating all these three designs into the sales and operation planning. Let me talk briefly about the area which, is, which was very, very key to them because a large, a substantial growth for Domino's comes from new products that they develop and launch in the market. Uh, and there were two large issues which we, which we saw. One was definitely the, uh, the way they were doing their new product li life cycle. And when we saw their new products life cycle, we clearly understood that they were not following a stage gate process. So there were a lot of complaints from everyone. There was no stage gate process. It was manual. There were a lot of delays. Uh, the, the whole assessment used to happen like, if I go to Domino's office, I can be offered a new product pizza, and I can be asked of my opinion around that. But it was all very internal. The, the testing was not being done at a larger consumer level and their feedback was not getting very quantifiably uh, rolled back into the new product introduction. So these were the, quite a few gaps that we came across. So the first thing we did was develop a state gate process. So as was being alluded by Bill, uh, where we went about CDOV approach and we cre created a state gate process so that we know very, very, very well in advance when to kill a product if it was not fetching value for us. Once we did that, it became e easier for us to create a stage gate and get the buy-in of the sales and marketing and the product development team. So the stage gate process looked like very, the st gate one will be talking about the creation of a concept. Gate two will be talking about from that concept what product can be, can be created. So for example, if you were to go, in, go in, if you were trying to do something around the Mexican food, so if you had to create something around Taco Bells or around taco kind of products for pizzas. So the concept would be around Mexican food and the product will, will be around something like tacos. And then we went about, uh, the th third gate was obviously about translating those products into the process level requirements, the packaging requirements, and so on and so forth. And then finally, the gate four was validation with the customers and rolling their feedback through conjoint analysis back into the new product introduction strategy. With this stage gate process, obviously there were some uh, challenges in terms of acceptance of uh, the R&D team, the sales and marketing team to get very disciplined to follow a stage gate process, but I think they understood the value of this in terms of driving the whole growth process. So once this was done, we also made sure that this was all automated and digitized, so we rolled out a project management system and a product lifecycle management system there by way of which the whole process, the whole workflow will get automated and uh, it will become much more disciplined in terms of new product introduction. So let, let me now get back into the supply chain. So I shared in the beginning of this presentation that we were facing issues around sustainable growth. The CEO wanted a very predictable kind of a, an exercise to be conducted where he would understand which processes are at risk and what are we going to do about those processes. I covered the new product development and the next in line is the supply chain process, processes. And let's see what we did there in the supply chain processes. So if I look at uh, the first part was store capacity. Now in store capacity, there were largely two areas. One was ad identifying, understanding the capacity of the store itself. There was no tool, there was no infrastructure with the group to understand what is my current store capacity. So if I, we only had the best sales ever uh, in terms of history from those stores, but we do not have any idea how can I predict the optimal uh, capacity of each store and that was to be done for 500 stores. So there was a huge exercise which was undertaken. It was again a CDOV or DFSS project where we tried to understand, uh, the objective was obviously to understand what and where, how many stores and where we should open those stores. And we were dealing with a lot of variables around the queue time, the process of the store itself, capacities, time to delivery, manpower required, the equipments required. So all these inputs were actually aggregated into a model and we understood the process and we used a simulation tool called Arena. I'm not trying to make it complex, but, but I, I have to tell you, there are not very many tools that you can, that you can use to predict the future. Or there are not very many tools that you that can very substantiate because the stakes were very high. If I, if I were to go to back to the CEO and say you open 10 commissaries instead of 5 or you open uh, 15 commissaries instead of 10, the, 
the impact of that suggestion would be huge because we are talking about investment in terms of hundreds of crores of rupees. So we have to be very sure of what we are going to predict and give back as a recommendation to the CEOs. So the, which is why we used various simulation tools and, uh, and prediction tools here in order to come out with a very robust output. What was interesting was this. So this tool gave out exactly which month, which store will actually peak out on its capacity. The yellow, uh, uh, the yellow symbol so shows that the capacity would reach a utilization of more than 90%. Red shows a utilization of more than 100%. But the more interesting thing here was that if I included the new product and promotions, this capacity would actually peak out even much earlier for a number of stores. That means I had to be very, very good, predictable, and robust, and quick in terms of assessment of where to open how many stores. They had drawn an investment plan which was pretty but like an Excel sheet. You go to a sales and marketing guy, he'll give you a number of pies for the next 10 years. And if you ask him, what's the market intelligence which has gone, in, gone inside, you, you would hardly get much out of it. Right? Similarly, the operations team says, okay, if this is the number of pies I'm going to sell, I have, I have to open 15 commissaries, 20 commissaries, I have, to, I have to open 600 more stores, and I have to introduce new lines altogether, more automation. So the CapEx number and the OpEx number were actually very, very daunting. And we, what, we, what we saw was that if we were to actually rely on that prediction with the, with the sales and the product operations team had given earlier, we would, despite doing such a high investment, we would still not meet our service delivery levels. That means our service delivery levels would get missed by more than 10%. So that means that plan was not actually really good. So with, with the plan that we, that, that we finally gave them, we gave them not the whole lines to be, to be put up, but actually the machines which are really the bottleneck to be put up. So that reduced the capital investment to a great extent. And we also predicted what will be this turnaround time for a pizza making in a store with this capacity being put. So we predicted that 96% of the times we will be able to turn around a pizza making in less than 11 minutes, which is really the service level. Because the rest of the, they have a 30 minute delivery promise for every calls that come in and the rest of the time they can easily access their consumer base in their, in their region. So this was very well accepted, and the store, uh, the DFS project around the store's capacity was really done. The next project we did was on reducing the number of days it took to open a store. This was fairly, this was relatively simple for us. We looked at some of the uh, other food companies, how much time were they taking to uh, actually open a new store. We looked at their fat work breakdown structure, and we looked at the gaps that they had. The gaps were very many, uh, poor project management structure, a lot of time to take approvals of the site where, the, where we buy these stores or we buy the space or we rent out the space, a lot of time in approvals which were going on. So we actually, I, I can't spell out the real numbers, but we created a new WBA work breakdown structure which was standardized across all the projects team, opening stores in various locations in India, and there were, but we predicted, and they are experiencing it, we predict, uh, predicted a reduce, reduction of 35% in the new stores opening time. <coughs> now, having done this, the next challenge for us was, was the commissary design. So we know now how many stores have to come up in which location in India and to, to actually sustain the entire growth, how many equipments, how many manpower would be needed. So my capital and operational expenditure numbers from a store's perspective is work, worked out. But still my commissary is not worked out and commissary is actually a very large expenditure because it serves 15 to 30 stores. If you look at this, the commissary design, this was another DFS project, and what we started off with was understanding what are the goals. So goals were simple, but the task was very daunting. The goals were that we have to identify how many commissaries, where should we open these commissaries so that they very optimally serve these stores, as each commissary is going to serve a number of stores. And what should be the size of the commissary, how many equipments, how many manpower will be needed there, because I had to calculate the CAPEX and the OPEX both. So the next thing we did was the design part. So we, we tried to understand what are the input variables. We looked at the value chain of the commissary. We looked at the business uncertainties in terms of demand. We looked at various input variables in terms of freight cost, processing cost, facility cost, manpower cost. We rolled all of them into a model. And then the next thing we did was put them in, put them all, all these models together and create substantiation in what we were saying. So for example, every pie that we sell was converted into a space requirement. So these pies will get into boxes, boxes will go, get into bags, bags will get into pallets. So everything was converted into space. Manpower requirement was worked out, equipment requ requirement was worked out. Once we worked out all these requirements, we put them all into a model. We said that if the demand is going to be these many lakhs of pies, 
how much space am I going to need, how much capex am I going to need, how much opex per commissary am I going to need. Right? All this was rolled into a software called Lamasoft, which does the center of gravity analysis. It tells us which are the best locations in India to open these store, these commissaries. And if I open these commissaries in these locations in India, I'm making sure that my capex is minimized, my opex is minimized, and I'm also minimizing my logistics cost. So this was the, a very strong recommendation in terms of all the regions which came out. This is the size of the commissary that I should open in each of these locations. Once this was achieved, it was left to verify. So we came out with the utilization factor for each of these commissaries and predicted what should be the timing for opening of these commissaries in different regions. Now, having done this, the next, the next important task for us was to, to discuss and optimize the logistics between the commissary and the stores. So what we did was we looked at our logistics model and our logistic practices. So what we did was another DFSS project here. So we looked at the context. It was to optimize the logistics cost. We understood the logistics. We used, again, an optimization model called log VRP. And we came out with what, what is the best way to optimize these routes. As you saw, saw we, had, we already had a fleet of 36 vehicles for a certain commissary. So this is a certain co commissary as an example, which is being shown here. The recommendation from the model was that we can reduce this fleet actually to 22 vehicles, while the number of stores that we can serve is actually going to go more. And the utilization would increase from 40% to 76%. The running kilometers would come down from 30,000 kilometers to only 20,000 kilometers or so. So this, this helped us minimizing our, our uh, logistics cost also. The next a task for us was to integrate all these three models, the commissary, store, and the logistics model, all of them together, and create a de and demand and supply balance. So we had the demand for the next 10 years. We had all the capacities worked out from the commissary standpoint, store standpoint, and logistics standpoint. And we had to give one final recommendation to the, to the business stakeholders in terms of this is the number of commissaries, this is the number of stores, this is your best logistics model, which can suffice. Best, the, the best thing that came out of this exercise was that all these models are pretty dynamic in nature. So tomorrow, if the business reality is changed, we don't have to redo this exercise, which took eight months. I just change the parameters in my model, and it will give me a new set of outputs. So I can do multiple scenarios on this model. So what we did with, uh, finally was a sales and operations planning process, the SNOP process. And in the SNOP process, what, what we started doing was we started looking at the problems, we, we knew that we, the entire sales and operation planning process had to be automated. That business never had any tool to predict what will be their bottlenecks in future based on certain demand patterns. They did not have any tools because these were such complex studies that were undertaken. Imagine, you know, uh, trying to capture a capacity model of a commissary under such non-standardized commissaries across the country. So every commissary has a different space in India today. Every store also has a different space. They have different furnace or different oven specifications also. So all the, we had to build a model which could actually understand all these needs and integrate them all together in an SOP, SNOP plan. So we, used, uh, used a, uh, we understood the situation, we understood the requirements. The whole business team actually very much appreciated this part of the integration. Because to, earlier, if the marketing guy would say, I can see through my promotion that my market demand may go up by 10%, would you be able to supply in terms of supply chain and operations? And nobody ever would be able to give an answer. Today, they, were, they can take just five minutes to run the whole scenario and give an answer. And that to a very predictable and robust answer. So we created the whole integration here where the demand and supply mechanisms could be vetted out. And our planning changed from something of a post-mortem of firefighting and bottlenecks to something where we can look any time in future, two years, three years, five years, ten years, and predict where would we face bottlenecks or issues, and how, to, how do we resolve them? So having addressed the new product development and the supply chain side, the business planning for future became very robust. We were able to reduce the capex and opex by more than 45% in order to optimize the whole thing. And this tool is going to be a dynamic tool which they can use. So the business obviously is very happy about that. And I think it was a great experience for us to do, some, to do, do Lean Six Sigma on an area which is about strategy. This is, about, this is like building the whole strategy for a business. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kulbhushan. <clears throat>
you talk about uh, talked about domino and uh, pizza so much i think everybody wants to be feeling hungry so i must keep the closing very short well we th we had three very nice presentation we started with mr bill remy who shared with us the typical product development challenges and he took us into various steps strategic insights prioritize process capabilities and communication and strategic uh, he emphasized know your customer and in process capability he says it's about processes not people and he asked an interesting question what is your product growth strategy both for existing and new products and he took us through the lean product development model through the process review and he shared various stage gates marketing feasibility concept feasibility product design product uh, pro uh, preparation launch and post launch review i think two things are very important concept feasibility and post launch uh, launch review is something you stressed is being missed but needs to give lot of attention design for volume as sales increases you should design for various levels of uh, sales volume rather than going into straight away into the first case and he showed what are the benefits with it and another interesting question he asked us how do you measure against industry standards or competition standards probably is asking us more for benchmarking from all view points and he gave a good case study and uh, his parting thoughts were very uh, very thought provoking he said do you set competitive advantage is product development and commercialization and launch are these your core competency and do you need to improve your processes i think um, what he said is very nicely summarized in that book good to great good to great very very uh, book based on lot of research where they say a company must know what are you passionate about a company must know where are you ahead of the competition and finally the third thing a company we should know which is the product which adds economic value to it which is very important normally in our we uh, lay a lot of stress on design and this thing but economic value is going to play a lot of good things and they under ultimately they say that don't change your there are two values process values and core values you don't have to change your core values you have to continuously improve your process value that's how understood i understood mr bill remy what you said and it was a great um presentation and great thought provoking process mr narayanan then presented a very interesting uh, uh, presentation i liked his presentation in showing mahesh as the customer and mahesh is the destroyer so i don't know what he had in the mind when he put lord shiva long customer in manufacturing we always used to say customer means jo kasht deke humko maarta hai probably he reinforced my thought process of the customer but it was a very very nice uh, uh, presentation starting with the issue of languages at various levels very important and then he told us uh, through the uh, various steps variance reduction value uh, excellence quality philosophy and he took us to level 7 where we are today we are designing the product rather than modifying it i think that is the stress and um, he said what is world class product excellence normally all companies called uh, world class sometimes in my ignorance i ask them what do you mean by world class what is your uh, uh, measurement of a world class uh, i have very rarely found a good answer but he tried to take us into world class product excellence telling us design excellence scm uh, supply chain management excellence operation excellence and service excellence and uh, he provided he gave us an equation that multiple multiple of all would give us something which will uh, tell us our rating on world class excellence quality versus complexity i think that was interesting that that something very new we saw today and change in approach suited to market need 
and change improvement approach he uh, again said attack wastages npi interpretation of waste and he showed us what are the various matrices kulbhushan as usual always gives the punch very hard and gives it very quickly it was excellent presentation uh, well first time i i thought even a domino requires dfss because my thought of dfss was only aircraft and automobiles and maybe some um, refrigerators and all that but that was great and i think i in the evening i'll be spending time in one of the domino outlet uh he took us through the various stages of the dfss program starting with the co's requirement and ending with the sales and at the last level where the customer eats it and he also showed us how the dmac is used for sales and business model but as always i think there was lot of thought provoking ideas which kulbhushan has left with us let's see how we improve our business, uh, uh, business with all the thoughts you have given well after having heard um, kulbhushan i think we'll skip the question and answer session we'll use the lunch time for those question and answer session and i thank you very much for uh, your attention for all the speakers and all the three speakers for the wonderful presentation may i request you to join for lunch please thank you very much